So yeah, I think, um, you know, as long as there's one person sitting in custody, uh, that, that basically because they're poor, without a showing of high risk, without a showing of danger to the community, uh, we still have a long way to go in my estimation. Could you please introduce yourself, Madam Judge? Yes. I'm Wendy Barish, and I'm Pat State for the Court of Common Pleas, and I apologize for being late. Um, and because you're the last one, I'm going to guess what the question was and tell you my problem with cash bail is that it's inherently discriminatory against poor people, and that it prioritizes and allows people who can afford the bail to take advantage of the process. But if you're poor and you can't afford it, your life is not any less. And that is my problem with the cash bail system, in addition to what we've heard. But I think it's inherently, inherently discriminatory. And the poor communities tend to be black and brown people, and they are the ones that are suffering from the current system as it currently is in Philadelphia. Okay. And so we're going to start with you, Lord. Okay. Right back. <laughs> um, our next question is based on related to effectiveness. Uh, while serving on the bench, do you believe you have a role in bringing important legal or judicial issues before the public or legislature? Why or why not? And what should your role be in relation to that? When you're a judge, your public role is somewhat limited in what you can do, but I think that you can demonstrate through your own action your opinions on legal issues that are relevant in the city. So I think you need to lead by example as a judge, and that when you are issuing decisions, I see on both, I'm primarily done civil work, I see judges issuing decisions without any opinions. And if you're going to decide something, you need to put in writing why you're making that decision. And that is how you establish what your position is. Yeah, as, as Wendy said, we're, judges have to be careful and limited. They can't be making public statements about ongoing cases. Um, but I do think that's a fair point that you know, judges will make decisions without actually putting anything on the record as to why, and they're like, oh, okay. Um, so there's really nothing to be learned. But I think if, if judges are more transparent, I think there's a place for that. Uh, I think community engagement, I mean, I know a few judges that have been really um, instrumental in starting new programs and getting about the reentry. And, and there are things that you can do as a judge to educate the community and to, um, you know, really be part of, you know, new solutions to trying new things, and I think that uh, be absolutely uh, appropriate for a judge to, to do that as much as they can within the confines of their job. As a judge, obviously not a legislature, but the way you bring awareness to something is by issuing an opinion, um, finding something's wrong, you know, the way it currently is. Um, you mentioned a quote earlier that from Thurby Marshall that, you know, laws have to change over time, and we realize that things as the way they stand are wrong. The way a judge handles that is this is a violation of someone's constitutional rights. This is a violation of due process, and therefore I'm issuing an opinion in order that's saying it's unconstitutional, and we're not going to abide by it. That's the power judges have. That's it's why this is such you know an important office to do. We were just speaking about cash bail. I mean, I can add a judge standing up on him and say, no, this isn't fair. It's a violation of people's due process rights. Um, to hold someone, you know, in custody uh, for the, the length of time that you see in Philadelphia. So that's really how you change things. But it takes some courage. I mean, you issue that kind of opinion, the system, if you will, go berserk. I mean, they'll go bananas. But maybe they do need to go bananas. Maybe someone needs to have the courage to stand up and do those things. And that's why you need you know, judges that are willing to do that. People that are that care about making a you know a good and a well thought decision. But if that's the right decision, then you make it. So, um, with regard to legislative matters, it's really not the place for judges to take any position on that process. You know, there are three branches of our government, and the judges serve as a particularly special role in that process, and we need to reserve ourselves from the political debate that's, that's going on in the legislature and the policy debates going on with the executive, so that we can remain impartial and that we can be viewed as being above the fray of those debates. Um, but with regard to kind of more general issues, and um, I think that we are still able to engage the community on an educational level. Not about there's so little education that we give to our children about the role of the judiciary. Um, I think a lot of us have gotten education on exactly what judges do in the last two years. Um, <laughs> but uh, there's more that we can do around that, um, so that people, as we take the mystery out of what it is. 
the, the judiciary does and how we fit into this grand government that we have. You know how you find how legislators find out what needs to happen with changes when there's a catastrophe, mm -hmm. when there's a bad decision that the public outcry is about. But who knew about this beforehand? It's probably the folks who are in the court system today, not just the judges, the lawyers, but the judges. They see problems, and we can, we've we talked about problems. We see a mile off. For us not to have any influence in or, or voice to legislate so they can inform their designing of a bill seems to be some disconnect. It's necessary. There should be some way where our impartiality is not compromised, but we can provide feedback or, or some sort of commentary, even on a anonymous basis, to legislators when they're designing these bills. I think that would be useful. There is some mechanism where chief justices of, of the courts um, are asked or judges told about certain changes as it relates to court process, but as it relates to laws, that's going to be, that's always going to come after the find something bad that's happened. And that should, it should be, the only way to get in front of that is really good in some sort of anonymous private conversations between legislators and judges about bills and problems of courts. I'm going to start out my response with a note of humility. Uh, if I am uh, lucky enough to, to get on the bench, probably I will not be overturning the tables in the first one or two years as a young trial judge. However, uh, it's important to get people who share your values on the court early so that they can be there for a long time and have the kind of impact that a 20 year judge can have. Um, it's really important. I recently had the opportunity to work with the Innocence Project to renegotiate the Post-Conviction Relief Act, which is the law that governs going back to court after you've been convicted and have your direct appeal if you have, for instance, new evidence. And we were able to, uh, it used to be that you had 60 days to come in uh, with new evidence, and now you've got a year. But in the conversations with the District Attorneys Association, it was clear that their perspective was so not uh, about the cities and so divorced from the realities of city court systems that they just couldn't understand that some of the stuff they were proposing would logistically stop our courts. Like it would not work at all in the first judicial district. So it's important that we have uh, representation everywhere so that we can be the voice of alarm, uh, you know, however we can and whatever we need to have. There are some judges who have been, uh, who have been giving good service as public intellectuals, like Richard Posner in Chicago, Jed Rakoff in New York. I just read something Jed Rakoff wrote about why innocent people plead guilty. I think that's something that people who don't, haven't had encounters with the criminal justice system don't intuitively understand. They think that guilty plea must mean he did it, right? Uh, they don't understand that uh, things got out of balance in terms of the executive versus judicial power. And the DA has so much more power than they did 50 years ago. So uh, there are ways to be a sort of small public intellectual that are consistent with the world judge. Thank you. So we're, I'm going to ask a few more questions, but I know we're running short on time. But I also want to give the folks who are here an opportunity. We're going to probably give maybe just two people questions, an opportunity to ask you guys questions. But uh, let's be finished these two questions, OK? Um, so the next question is a two-part. Uh, please describe one instance in which you faced an ethical dilemma on how and how you resolved it, and have you ever been disciplined by the Bar Association? I have never been disciplined by the Bar Association. Um, ethical dilemmas are tough, uh, because sometimes you can't talk about them as much as you'd like to. Uh, there are certainly, one situation we face pretty routinely is dealing with somebody who has mental illness and isn't getting the treatment that they need. Uh, but, description of that. I'll just flag it as something that I think uh, we could use some work on. There's no mandatory training for people who receive court appointments on how best to communicate with somebody who has an illness or somebody who has some actual disability. And yet, the defense attorney is the one responsible for flagging the issue. <coughs> there is an issue of competency, for instance, to be. Uh, so that's something that we could change and that I think bears thought. Um, if you are a defense attorney and you find out from your client that they have an out-of-jurisdiction conviction, 
and the other side, for whatever reason, doesn't know about this conviction, it would affect the prior record score. The way you arrive at sentencing guidelines is by looking at the offense gravity score and the prior record score, kind of bringing them together in chart. So if you are the only legal professional in the room that knows that the prior record score is actually higher than the <coughs> assistant district attorney is saying, but the judge asks you, is that his prior record score? It's not really what the judge should ask, but it happens all the time. You have to figure out how to deal with that. So you, you could say, we're not contesting the prior record score. Uh, but we have a duty of candidate to try to do We also have an absolute duty to keep privileged information privileged. Uh, yes, well, first, I've never been disciplined by the Bar Association. Uh, as far as ethical dilemmas, one of the ethical dilemmas that a lot of people I'll just speak from my experience um, that I found myself in is when I work for a firm in their billable hour structure. Um, folks who have to hire a lawyer have to pay an attorney for their fees. Well, some firms have practices where their billing structure, the pressure of associates to bill, even create billing entries to absorb retainers was a, was a particular problem in this particular firm. Um, I left that firm because I refused to fabricate my bills. I refused to exaggerate my hours. I refused to in, uh, increase, do unnecessary legal things for the purposes of uh, getting to a billable place. Um, and that's, that's one of the things that I have dealt with. And I, I felt that I, I made my commission known to the part of the firm as well as the firm itself, and I was on. So, um, also, I've never been subject to any discipline. And um, with regard to ethical issues, I run into them a lot. Um, I was responsible for running intake at Community Legal Services for eight years. So, one of our core responsibilities is to identify potential conflicts of interest and appropriately address those. And that's one of the, the big issues in um, ethics is determining. Making sure you can making sure that you remain a zealous advocate and that you once you pick a side, you can't change sides. You gotta stay on that same side. And um, even if that person stops being your client, your duties to that former client don't immediately disappear. Or it's sometimes they never disappear. So um, I often would encounter potential conflicts of interest and have to resolve those. Um, we've had a few instances where we've had actual conflicts of interest where it's didn't get caught initially, and now we're in the middle of a mess where we have two clients and there is a conflict, and unwinding that is particularly difficult. We basically have to discontinue representation of both individuals. Um, I've had some situations where other attorneys not in my organization have done some really horrendously bad ethics violations, stealing client money, 